So last time we were talking about some of the debates around global poverty, extreme poverty, and how aid or philanthropy uh, might make a difference in elevating people out of extreme poverty, of helping them elevate themselves out of extreme poverty. And my hesitation in the way I just said that is, is really at the heart of a debate in uh, foreign aid and, and uh, whether it's through governments or foundations about whether there's a poverty trap or whether aid creates dependence. And uh, we, we could see this, and the, the, you know, the most famous example of this is the debate between William Easterly and Jeffrey Sachs, but I don't want to focus too much on, on uh, debates between people, but really the, the issues at stake here, and, it, 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 and you, it's pretty easy to grasp. The poverty trap people feel that uh, some parts of the world and, uh, be, and, and, and some, uh, 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 some groups of people are um, just not quite on the ladder of economic growth. Remember, we talked about how economic growth and is, is the key to the uh, alleviation of extreme poverty. It's not just dealing with extreme suffering, although that does have a moral claim on us to be sure, uh, it is dealing with extreme suffering in such a way as to provide the opportunity for those who are suffering to experience economic growth, to initiate economic growth so that they are no longer dependent on our efforts or someone's efforts to alleviate their suffering. So uh, the argument of those who think there's a poverty trap and that aid can get people out of it is that in a region that's, say, that's suffering from severe uh, tropical diseases, uh, uh, and, uh, dirty water, lack of sanitation, um, uh, malaria th uh, through, uh, uh, from, from mosquitoes, uh, that uh, in such an area, uh, you need to give a kind of aid that will break out of the cycle of suffering, the cycle of oppression, the cycle of economic stagnation, and by doing that, you give people the, the, the opportunity to initiate their own economic growth, that they're stuck in this trap cycle of poverty, and that aid lifts them out of the trap and into a, a, a more virtuous circle of development, not solving all their problems, but letting them have the, the capacity to solve their own problems. On the other hand, you have people who say that precisely by intervening in those hardship areas, we create an expert expectation of intervention, an expert expectation of intervention that then um, uh, diminishes the capacity of the recipients of aid to help themselves. Now, I'm not going to try to solve this problem. Very a lot of s smart people, people with a lot more expertise than I have in this area, um, uh, will debate this still in journals, uh, academic journals, and newspapers around the world. Uh, uh, our interest today, uh, as we as we f finish up our, uh, at least my section on uh, on poverty and, and aid, is to talk about uh, RCTs, randomized control trials. Um, which are efforts to not provide one single answer to whether there's a poverty trap or whether there you create a culture of dependency, but to actually test interventions to see how they affect uh, specific communities. Um, so um, what we want to have through these interventions are small steps uh, that judiciously implemented make um, uh, differences in the lives of people so that they can then initiate the changes to make um, uh, their own changes. Even the critics of aid uh, acknowledge the poorest people in the world do need assistance of some kind to um, get them out of a cycle of, uh, of poverty and suffering. And that's the Sachs approach and the approach of the World Bank and other uh, inter uh, intervening organizations. It is possible to create economic growth and innovation with social protection. And you can see this in many uh, developed no nations as well, um, uh, that combination. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit before we close out my remarks on uh, poverty and aid with the work of the president of the World Bank. I've been, uh, I've been mentioning his work and the work of uh, that institution uh, various points in this, in, in this lecture. And now I'd like you to look at his, 
His brief remarks at the Social Goods Summit, Dr. Kim was um, speaking not long after uh, a terrorist attack in Kenya on a mall that left many people dead and and, uh, was much on the minds of the audience in New York during the Social Goods Summit. And so you'll hear him talk about that in his video. Uh, And and he'll also talk about the importance of uh, politics and political energy in creating a social movement. Uh, to deal with um, extreme poverty. Uh, he's, a, he's someone who's optimistic, uh, even though he spends his time in some of the most uh, challenging parts of the world. He's optimistic because he has seen what the combination of expertise and social movements can, can do. I'm very proud to introduce our next speaker. This is one of our keynote listeners, uh, Dr. Jim Yong Kim from the World Bank. Please welcome him. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm so thrilled to be back here at the 92nd Street Y. But let me start uh, with uh, some reflections and uh, um, a bit of thought about what's happening in Kenya uh, over the last two days. Um, Many of you know there was a terrorist attack uh, in Kenya at, um, at the Westgate Mall. And um, uh, as the World Bank Group, we have a large operation in, uh, in Nairobi. And we had um, about 10 people who were in that mall when the terrorist attack happened. Thankfully, we got them all out last night by 5 o'clock, and they're all safe. But not only, not only our Nairobi staff, but staff throughout the World Bank lost um, uh, family members, lost friends. And I just want to reflect a little bit on what this means. You know, the group was Al-Shabaab, and this was not about Kenya, it was about Somalia. Somalia is a country where 43% of the people live in extreme poverty. You know, when the Secretary General came to the World Bank and we did a panel together, uh, and he was speaking to the finance ministers of 188 member countries of ours, he said something that will always stick in my mind. He said, in every country I have ever been, The key to peace is development. You know, when we talk about a movement to end poverty, we're not just trying to create a movement out of thin air. We're trying to address the most critical problems on earth. The Secretary General got it exactly right. Unless we tackle the 43% of the people in Somalia who are living in extreme poverty, the prospects for peace simply won't be very good. You know... um, uh, the, the, a movement to end poverty is an idea that's beginning to grow. Now, what will it take to actually end poverty? Well, you know, we're, at the World Bank Group, we've studied this for almost 70 years. And here are some really critical elements that we know now. We do need economic growth. We need economies to grow. We need private sector, sectors to grow. And we need to create good jobs. And, and more importantly, the second thing is that those jobs have to include young people, women, the, the extreme poor, people who've been left out of the job market before. Everywhere in the world, we're seeing social movements pop up in places where no one expected them. I'm an anthropologist. I've studied social movements, and nobody expected the Arab Spring. Uh, very few expected what we saw in middle-income countries like Turkey and Brazil. The bottom line is that the poorest want to be lifted out of poverty, want to lift themselves out of poverty. But even the people who are emerging into the middle class want better health care services, want better educational services, want a future for their children. So the, 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 the task to end poverty, we need to do the, the things that we've always done, focus on economic growth, but we need to be inclusive. But the third thing, the thing that I think could really change things is to begin a social movement. Now, Many of you know about the Global Poverty Project. Next week, there is uh, a concert to end poverty. And if you haven't already, look at the, look at the, look at the, um, uh, the petition online. It's at zero, uh, zeropoverty2030.org, Z-E-R-O poverty2030.org. Everyone in the world, uh, leaders, politicians, uh, philanthropists, have to know that all of you care about ending poverty. Uh, I have been part of social movements my whole life. We, uh, I've been working in, um, in, in global health in places like Haiti, in, in, in Latin America, 
like in, in countries like Peru, uh, even in places like um, uh, Siberia, where we worked on, uh, on tuberculosis projects. We have been part of movements that have been pretty successful. The global movement around AIDS was one of the most successful movements in history. We now need a global movement to end poverty. We need to bring on board uh, the faith-based groups. We need to bring on board uh, NGOs and CSOs, especially those NGOs and CSOs that are not household names, the smaller ones. If we can build a movement and, and, and make it clear to every single leader in the world that we care about poverty and that we can end it, we can do something unprecedented. You know, it was only 1990 when 43% of the human beings on this planet were living in extreme poverty. We made tremendous progress, and by 2010, we had cut that uh, number down to about 21%. So five years ahead of schedule, uh, uh, of, the, of the schedule that was set by the Millennium Development Goals, we halved the global poverty rate. And now we're already below 20%, but the next stages are gonna be the most difficult. In order to end poverty by 2030, we have to have it once, have poverty twice, and have it almost a third time in order to get to a level where we, where we will feel that we've ended extreme poverty. Once again, we can do it. For us at the World Bank Group, IDA, our, our fund for the poorest, is our most important tool. But everyone has to get involved. And everyone has to remember that in the fight to end poverty, we're also tackling problems like the ones we see in Somalia. Uh, the Secretary General and I just traveled to the Great Lakes region where we went to the Democratic Republic of the Congo, to Rwanda, and to Uganda. And because we have this fund called IDA, we were able to put on the table an extra $1 billion in a place that still hadn't really uh, coalesced around the peace agreement. And it was based on our conviction, the Secretary General's and mine, that for now and for now on and forevermore, peace and development have to be linked together. Before, that's not what we did. We would go in and sign peace treaties and we would wait and see if the peace would hold. And then afterwards, maybe we would go in with some development projects. We're not going to do that anymore because we know that the key to peace is ending poverty. You know, um, I have a four-year-old son. And uh, my four-year-old son... Uh, by the time he's my height and he's uh, about to graduate from college, we could have ended extreme poverty. He could possibly graduate from college into a world in which no one was living in extreme poverty. I'm so glad to be here. I need your help. You guys have uh, 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 fomented so many great things uh, in the world. What we need right now is a global movement to end poverty, a global movement to end poverty that just might bring about peace in some of the most difficult places on earth. We're counting on you, and I know that we can do it. Thank you very much. So I'm here with uh, Dr. Jim Kim, who's the president of the World Bank, and it's a pleasure to have him here today to talk with us about how to change the world, specifically about issues of uh, extreme poverty and global health. And I thought, Dr. Kim, we'd start off by talking a little bit about our current situation in which we see, in from one perspective, rising levels of prosperity, but also uh, increasing uh, levels of inequality. And I, I wondered if you would talk a little bit about the relationship of uh, inequality and extreme poverty today. You know, first of all, ha thanks for having me on. This is a great idea. And uh, I just, you know, s salute, Michael, your leadership in, in, in taking on a course like this. For the World Bank Group, we've been looking at this for some time. And in 2006, we wrote a whole report uh, looking at the issue of equity. Right. And uh, that report starts off by looking at the life chances of two people born in South Africa, one uh, a black South African and one a white South African. And then later it compares that, th those two, the chances of those two people to someone born in Denmark. Uh -huh. And uh -huh. as stark as the differences are between the, the, the white child and the black child, 
Uh, both of them have huge differences with the child born in Denmark. And so one of, one of the things that, that, that we're focusing on here is the critical importance of equality of opportunity. Yes. And this, has, this is, ranges from health to education. Uh, and, and what we're working very hard for is that countries have got to commit to trying to build equality of opportunity. And there's some really interesting data. And, you know, at IMF, uh, um, uh, they show that countries with higher inequality have periods of growth that are shorter and ultimately lead to lower overall economic growth. Um, uh, Bill Easterly has, has, has found that high structural inequality poses real significant barriers uh, to prosperity, quality institutions. Uh, there's a lot of very good evidence that suggests that uh, uh, inequality in a society really does limit overall growth. Now, you know, there, there, there's not uh, uniformity of opinion on this, right, and there, it's right. still an open question. But I think another element that has, um, uh, that has surfaced recently, and if you look at the, um, at, at the uh, um, uh, Arab Spring, <clears throat> now what happened there was that there was economic growth. There was actually GDP growing at very high rates in some countries. But what we know is that young people and uh, marginalized groups, women, were not participating in that growth. Yeah. And the, uh, it, uh, the unemployment rates were very high. And even in countries that have made efforts to reduce inequality, Turkey and Brazil are good examples, you know, what we're seeing there is that uh, inequality of access to quality education in Brazil, for example, inequality of access to, to quality services, this all led to uh, uh, protests happening this past summer right. that uh, really surprised everybody. So there's some really important lessons. The, the economic data seems to suggest that at least in several very important instances, greater inequality leads to slower growth. But on a much more direct level, I think all politicians now begin to understand that if you allow uh, inequality to persist and people really do understand that there's a whole middle class out there that's enjoying opportunities to health education, social protection, and good jobs, then uh, what we know is that everyone has access to smartphones. Everyone, yeah. uh, that, that people you would never expect have access to Twitter and Facebook. And so things have changed for leaders. Yeah. And so what we're seeing here is that you know, people now, the, the notion that health and education and social protection were things that were just expenses. And you know, the most important thing was growth. And as long as you had growth, then you could let yeah. those things yeah. go because eventually the growth would trickle down. I, I, I think that uh, just about every leader in the world now has this understanding that growth is extremely important, but you ignore that bottom 50 or 40 percent at your peril, including for your political future. So you mentioned Bill Easterly's work, and there's a whole school around um, uh, in development economics, as you know better than I do, that that worries about whether certain forms of aid, uh, certain forms of redistribution of wealth, uh, actually create cultures of dependency or distortions uh, of behavior that have unintended consequences that do not benefit the poor, whereas other people um, i just I just did an interview with Jeffrey Sachs uh, a little while ago today talk about the the moral obligation as well as the economic uh, rationale of liberating people from uh, poverty traps um, uh, they worry less about a culture of dependency and and more about um, um, the suffering that becomes uh, a vicious circle, and I wonder if, if you would, uh, you know, how, how does the how do you and the world how does the World Bank think about this this tension between those who worry about a culture of dependency and those who urge us to really address the uh, immediate suffering of the the most poor? You know, uh, uh, I have great admiration for both Bill Easterly and Jeff uh, Sachs. Jeff is a close friend uh, whom I've worked with uh, for years, and, and let me put it this way: so <clears throat> I, I don't. I, I think that uh, um, the work that uh, Bill Easterly has done, people like Dumbi Samoya um, mm -hmm. uh, ha have done, this is, real, this is important stuff because they're taking a very hard look at how effective aid has been. You know, um, I, I was part of um, a movement called 50 Years is Enough. Right. And uh, this movement uh, called for the closing of the World Bank on its 50th anniversary, which was about 20 years ago. Now, I have to say I'm very glad we lost that argument. <laughs> but, but in many ways, Michael, you know, we won the argument because the, 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 what we were arguing was that the World Bank was focused so much on growth. And they were basically at one point saying, mm -hmm. look, there's a formula. You've got to get the macroeconomic fundamentals right and focus on growth. Um, you know, 
charge for, for basic health care. Education will come along. But the most important thing is reduce your public expenditures and focus on your growth model by getting the macroeconomic fundals, fundamentals right. They were right in so many ways. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the work that was done, Jeff was part of that group yep. of helping countries get the macroeconomic fundamentals right, I think is, is one of the big reasons that during the last five years when everyone else's growth, especially in the developed world, was hit, the developing countries did well. Yeah. And part of it was they had separated central banks from ministries of finance. They weren't printing money to solve their problems. There's so many things that they did right. You know, debt to GDP ratios had gone down. They were managing their debt more effectively. So a lot of the, these fundamentals were important. But I think what uh, was less appreciated was that you've got to get your growth strategy right, but you also have to invest in your people. Yeah. That was the argument we were making. We were, we were saying, you know, you cannot undervalue the importance of investment in people. And now, here at the World Bank Group, the thing that's most exciting to me is that there's a tremendous amount of research on the programs that have worked and the programs that have not worked. And, you know, what we know for sure is that you cannot approach this from an ideological point of view, yeah. right? Yeah. Market-based reforms, privatization, you know, uh, export-oriented strategies is good for everybody. There's really nothing uh, that's good for everybody. Yeah. So w- the way we've been trying to, 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 to move the discussion, and, you know, I, I, I would hope that both Bill Easterly and, and Jeff, uh, I know Jeff in, embraces this idea, is we've been talking about creating what we call a science of delivery. Yes. In other words, let's be really specific about what worked, why, and where, yep. and then talk about how that can be taken to other places and scaled up. Right? Mm-hmm. So let me just give you an example. Has aid ever worked? Well, look at my the country of my birth, South Korea. Right. I was just there a month ago. right? And the World Bank made huge investments uh, in, in our fund for the poorest called IDA. We made huge mm-hmm. investments in Korea. And I was just there, and they were saying that the World Bank's investments were critical from in, for, in, in us getting off the ground. But here's what else they said. But one of the things that was important for us is we actually didn't listen to the World Bank <laughs> advice all the way. We invested in health. We invested in education before anyone thought we could afford to. Yeah. And then right after Korea, I went to Japan. The Japanese said, we invested in universal health care before anyone thought that we had any right to even think about it. Mm. And so you look around at the kinds of investments that have been made in people and the links to growth. I mean, you know, Turkey, just in, you know, in the early 2000s, made huge investments in health and dramatically dropped their maternal mortality rate, their infant mortality rate, changes that usually people think take a long time. Yeah. Yeah. They did it really quick and they are convinced that it had a huge impact on their current growth uh, trajectory, which is really quite good. Now, what Turkey learned is that, that you know, you're as good as what you did in the last week yeah. because there were protests right. in Turkey. So you got to keep you got to keep at it. But here's here's what I th- you know you cannot argue about moral responsibility to end poverty versus a culture of dependence. You, you've got to step back and and ask yourself what kind of investments can be made <clears throat> that will enable people to build the foundations for the future growth that we know is critical. There are so many countries in the world that are just not going to be able to fund the kind of health and education investments that are needed right now to build that foundation yeah. for future growth. And so what we, what we would say is let, let's move from the ideological and move to the specific. There is $125 billion of official development assistance out there. I think that uh, we have to just uh, uh, be extremely humble and grateful uh, mm-hmm. for the generosity of the donor countries, but I think it implies that we have to be much more uh, rigorous about knowing what works and why, and then take the responsibility to take those things that work and take them to scale.